Thanks everyone for coming. I know it's, it's kind of later in the afternoon and there's a lot of great sessions out there. So the fact that you're willing to come in here and spend an hour with us talking about a subject that's kind of near and dear to me, which is DevSecOps or security DevOps or Sec DevOps or DevOps with security or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and that's part of the problem. But we're going to we're going to spend the next hour talking about what what is uh, what is inhibiting greater dev DevOps and security integration working better together, making our applications, our software, our data more secure. Before we get started, though, let's we have a rather large panel, as you can see, but we have an hour and each each one of these people on here are in and of themselves rock stars. So collectively, I guess it's sort of like a super band. And uh, which means we'll Asia. release one we album do, and yeah. then we'll break up. One album and we're done. <laughs> um, that being said, though, let me introduce our panel starting at the far right, Carolyn. Hello, I'm Caroline Wong. I'm the vice president of security strategy for Cobalt, which is a manual pen test company. Um, I've been in the cybersecurity field for 12 years now. I started out leading security teams at eBay and Zynga, and then transitioned to the vendor side. Uh, Symantec, followed by management consulting at Sigital, and joined Cobalt about a year ago. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, hi, I'm Anders Walgren, Chief Technology Officer at Electric Cloud. We're, we don't do a lot of security, but our customers do, so. That's part of the problem, too. I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, Rob Stroud, I'm Principal Analyst at Forrester covering uh, DevOps and uh, loving it, it's fun. Uh, my claim to fame is I am actually the conduit between the operations team and the security team due to the fact that uh, I spend a lot of time and do uh, security for a hobby. So I don't have a clue why I'm here, but I slept in a Holiday Inn last night. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> that used to work, not as good as these days. But, um, you know, I, I, I've been part of DevOps Enterprise Summit from the beginning, co-author of DevOps Handbook. Um, just been deeply involved. I'll say this. Um, I've studied this thing called DevOps as hard as anybody else. I don't say I know more than anybody, but I don't think anybody has studied this, um, what this thing is that we call DevOps, harder than I have. Uh, so that's kind of my claim to fame. Uh, Paul Crasher with a federal contractor called uh, CSRA. Um, I'm friends with some security people. Uh, no. <laughs> the security people have no friends. Go ahead. No, but uh, uh, obviously I work in the federal government and specifically I uh, now work in the Intel space. So uh, a lot of secret squirrels and obviously a lot of security concerns. Hi, I'm Kurt Yanko. I'm currently an architect with Sonatype, but uh, in this context, really, I'm drawing on my experience of uh, heading up a DevOps team within a Fortune 100 company, an insurance company and reaching out to security. So I was coming at it as a non-security person who was trying to understand how we could work together. And I'm Alan Schimmel. I'm the editor-in-chief founder of DevOps.com, which is about four years old right now. But prior to that, I have many years, a lot of years in security. <laughs> uh, founded a security company or two and have been involved in the security community way before we called it cybersecurity. It was InfoSec and security for a long time. And the reason I originally came into DevOps really is because of security. I thought it was a great thing about, you know, for this was going to be the greatest thing for security, this DevOps thing. And it, I still believe that today, and hopefully we all will here when we leave this panel today. Let me just give you some of the ground rules, though. Totally unrehearsed. We have, I have not, I <laughs> have not spoken to any of these people about this other than Curtis, Rob and Anders and I did a similar kind of thing in Jenkins. Same thing though. There are no slides. There are, there's no script. This is raw. And the reason I don't have one of these mics is I have this because I'm going to come out there and it's an audience participation panel. We didn't tell you that when you came in, but it's going to doors. be okay. That's why I said lock the doors. Yeah. Um, so please feel free, raise your hand. I'll come out and get you. The, the premise of this, though, is, look, running at DevOps.com, one of the hottest topics, most controversial, generates the most comments, the most angst, the most anger, is this topic that we've come to call DevSecOps. Even calling it DevSecOps creates controversy. I've had some of my friends in security tell me, bullshit, it's Sec DevOps, because after <laughs> all, security is the most important thing. I've had other people in the DevOps community, and John, you know this, you've, you've heard them say, hey, there's only one DevOps. DevOps <laughs> is DevOps. 
right? You don't need to add security to it. You don't need to add business to it. You don't need to add testing or QA or anything else. It's DevOps, and it encompasses all of that. <laughs> and other people say, well, no, no, security is security. So why? Why, why can't we, why can't security work better with, with our friends in Dev and Ops and DevOps? And some of you, well, let, let's take a quick poll to start. In your organization, is security working with your Dev and Ops folks? Working well. Okay. Don't 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 feel don't feel bad. You're you're pretty much unfortunately the norm. Why? And and that's what we want to explore a little bit here. So I thought we'd start with our analyst, because after all, he's an analyst. Rob, why why do you why do you think we we're seeing this disconnect with you know security working better with DevOps? So uh, it's really interesting. So if I go back to my time in banking where I ran a security team, we set policy standards and selected tools. And then we imposed it on you. Here it is, do it. And uh, sometimes we took your input, sometimes we didn't. You know, so we, we were working on these, these risk mitigation matrices, mm -hmm. which you know very well. Sure. And uh, we, we decided that everything was a risk and every risk needed to be mitigated in a story. And uh, the world's you know, transition and change, yet security, as we've all moved along, not every organization's security has moved the same way. Uh, some of your organizations have, by the way, and some of you have been hit by a cyber incident which has caused you a massive transition of security. So now you have uh, one organization I know has a 400 person security team. They had their own service desk, their own incident response unit, their own developers, their own remediation team, and now they've got their own pen testing team. And what they come and do though, is the developers develop, the operations implement, and then, then security come along and say, here's your security apply. And we can't do that anymore. We, no. We're not developing that way. And that's where the disconnect is. Now, some of you, by the very nature of you being in this room, have transformed. And, and my other colleagues will talk about that. But the reality it is that we need to transform the way the security organization sits. And that's the fundamental disconnect at the moment in the majority of cases. John, you're, you're, the, you're the voice of DevOps. What do you say? You know, you, you said you talked about um, the, the DevOps and like everybody tried to change the name. And, and I was one of those strong defenders of it's a metaphor, stupid. Like, <laughs> you're like, Mark, no, no, just think of it as a metaphor between two teams that can't collaborate. And I, I would get very annoyed when people would try to like, why can't we do ops to have this, this, this? And, and I, I, I even convinced our good friend, Josh Corman, mm -hmm. he talks about like, I got him to that space. Don't, and he called it rugged DevOps. Yeah. yeah. And then um, I show up at RSA early this year and I hear the people talking about DevSecOps. And, and I, I talked about this, some of you saw my last, if you saw my last presentation, I said, you know what? Rugged was interesting, but it didn't give me that holistic, systems approach to everything I believed about how we deliver software in the supply chain. And I started seeing people show the every box has something in it and they called it DevSecOps. I was like, okay, I like this. And then I went to a couple of people I knew who were very savvy, large institutional people who had been doing DevOps. And I said, have you heard about DevSecOps? And their eyes lit up. And I'm like, sorry, Josh. I'm a hypocrite. I'm going to call it Dev Second. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it goes. So before I ask the rest of our panel to weigh in, let me just also add the one, you know, something I learned from John three, four years ago when I started DevOps.com. We, we all hear about DevOps being such all about culture, right? And, and if you're at does, you're learning. Culture is paramount to successful DevOps transformations, right? I would put forth the proposition that the problem we have is that, and Carolyn, you're our security person here, Curtis, you are, security has a dysfunctional culture, right? We, we rel and I'm a security person, I, I get it, right? You go to, if you've ever been to a security show like Black Hat or something like that, you should go just to see how weird it is sometimes. <laughs> but um, It's weird, it's, but, it's definitely but, weird. You know, weigh in on that sure, if you can. So, so, a security person might believe that you should put a $200 fence around a $5 asset. <laughs> and that's, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, 
the reason that DevOps exists is to support the business. The reason that security exists is to support the business. Um, as Rob was saying, the landscape has changed. Um, you know, 10 years ago, security was about protecting corporate networks. So you had a perimeter that you could secure, on-premise data centers, on-premise workforces. Um, there's sort of this analogy about security being like an M&M, like hard on the outside, soft and melty in the center. <laughs> so now that's different because we have global workforces. We have these like we have these ecosystems, right? Organizations are not isolated anymore. They're, they're integrated with their vendors. They are a vendor to someone else. And now it's not about the network because infrastructure has become code. The focus is no longer on corporate and IT. Now it's about products and applications and APIs. And that's a, that's a really dramatic difference. And it's different for a security person to think, oh, I need to put a $200 fence around this $5 asset than to think, oh, it's my job to protect this $5 asset and what's an appropriate way to go about doing so. And maybe the first step is to actually learn about that $5 asset. Excellent, excellent. Curtis, you wanna weigh in? Yeah, I mean, this started out with, I think, you know, the idea that security hasn't kept up, like that, right? There's this disconnect and they have this uh, cultural history of sort of imposing, right? And I, I think that created this culture where dev and sec never talked. And I know it was the case where I was because I, I was a little different. I literally, I scheduled a meeting with the security person and said, I think I can help you. And they were like, no one has ever come to security and offered <laughs> to help. Like that doesn't happen. And I said, but you know, I got this cool Jenkins thing and I could probably help you with like your static analysis. And I could probably like make it part of what happens all the time with everything that we do. And they're like, wow, that's really, really interesting. You know, so, so it was, I think you have to go knock on the door and go shake somebody's hand and go have a conversation and find out how you can work together. And that, that's why if you haven't done that, those are the companies that the security is lagging behind. And if you have done it, those are the folks that are raising their hands in the room. So, so that, somebody, that's my view excellent. on why we are where we are and what you can do. Somebody made a great comment at that lunch today, which was it, talking about their role in DevOps. If DevOps was hyphenated, I am the hyphen, okay. right? <laughs> I am the person who takes, you know, who brings these two things together. So maybe by putting sec between dev and ops, we can make that happen. What I'm afraid of is that it becomes between. You know, right. and, and that it continues to be, I mean, and, and, and for good reason in some ways, right? Because, I mean, security is an existential, one of the few existential threats to corporations or to, to our assets, to our privacy, to our, you know, all of those kinds of things. That's a big deal. That's a huge deal in, in the world of IoT and, you know, my heart rate and, you know, why, why is my heart rate so high? Well, I'm on a panel. Um, you know, all of, all of those kinds of things. And, 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 and I think the, the you know, so we have to take it seriously. We do take it seriously, but but I think it begins with communication, mm -hmm. understanding each other's motivations, goals, and and you know understanding a, you know the complexity has, of that. It has a different tenor, um, which I personally experienced. So I was running uh, a large program actually for gentlemen sitting over there, and one of the things that I had to do there was a contract that said that I, Paula, am going to personally sign a piece of paper that I am personally responsible for the financial impact yep, yep. the company will incur Amen. should we have, oh, but no. try signing one of those. That's not good. Well, I'd, I'd sign that as long so as I get the money if we're successful too. People have to get liability. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This admin has to get liability. So, yeah. Someone had good. to be accountable yeah, it's and terrible. it was me. No, no. Yeah, and it was different than, I was also accountable if the system went down, I was also accountable for a lot of other things, but the difference is it was like a meteor strike, yeah, right? Yeah. Is that it was this like rare event, but oh my gosh, if it happens, I'm ruined. Mm. I mean, so I think it takes a different characteristic and the challenge you can have, and, and I'll, I'll park the, does security have the right culture? Does ops have the right culture? That's a different animal. Even if you had that, do you have the visibility? Because it's really complex. Yeah. And security even if everyone is, is aspiring to do all the right things, and if you've ever sat in a sock, it's kind of a scary place. And I understand why security people are really paranoid yeah. <laughs> because think, it's a scary place. And so but, it's- But the one throat to choke thing is, it's, a, it's so it's, prevalent, right? And, and I guess so the point is that's bad. Real. That's real <laughs> and it goes all the way up to the board. And so it changes just that reality, changes the entire conversation because it's the one thing 
the the CEO is like, I could lose my job. I could go to right? jail. I could go to jail. It's, it's like, a different you know, thing than the server yeah. goes down, you just go apologize and I, you I, know, it's a different, it's not the same listen thing. Listen to Sorry. Decker, to, just listen to Decker today in his closing keynote, Sydney Decker, like he does resiliency, safety, not even IT, don't miss it. Um, we went to dinner last night with John Ospar and John said something, this is completely out of security, but like I, I've got to say this, he says, I fear the day that my kids might be in a world where we have to sign those kind of contracts to be computer people, um, to be in the software business because, you know, the financial liabilities and those things. I mean, that's uh, that will ruin our industry. It'll ruin. I mean, mm -hmm. so I mean, I'm going to just do my one pulpit thing. Shut up. So I think what Paula is speaking to is a change in the driver for why security matters. So mm -hmm. security matters for three reasons. One of them is to do sales and to prepare for an acquisition. The second is to avoid negative press and the third is to be compliant. And those things matter more in a DevOps world because business decisions are not made by IT and they're not established by these long-term relationships that depend on all of these like capital expenditures. Um, they're made by folks who are buying solutions in the cloud and they're just doing it wherever they want, whenever they want. But if I'm engaging with a vendor who is in the cloud, maybe I need to figure out, can I trust this product or the solution if I'm going to be buying it or if I'm going to be integrating it? And I, and I think that makes the driver really different. We do have a question in the back. Absolutely. We've got our first, our first audience participation here. Hold on. <laughs> Come on over. got the obstructed view seats. Oh. Like, so, oh, so when you talk about <clears throat> I'm libel, when the security guy is libel, the question when you ask is, what is acceptable risk? His answer is none. In a DevOps world where you have somebody, and so in the $200 fence over the $5 piece, his answer is it's worth it because if, if the $5 piece gets stolen, I get fired. Right. It's easy. In a DevOps world where you want collaboration, who gets to decide what's acceptable risk? Well, just, just to be clear, uh, I owned it because I was the executive in charge of the account. Right, it Not be the because business. I was the security person. No. So I had to own both delivery, which by the way, I was also paid Income to recharge. deliver, and I had to own the risk, but those are not equal things on the scale. So let me let you in on a little that's, dark that's, secret. But I think the business does have to own it. And I thought it was a very, um, I think it was uh, Capital One's talk when they were right. talking about the three risks, right? The ownership starts with the team building the system. And then there's the, you know, that's a great model. But three lines of defense. Yeah, yeah. the three lines of defense. I mean, I was glad that they shared that. That's I mean, something would, that some of us in the security would, world know about. Would but, you ask a quality person to sign a piece of paper that says, there shall be zero I, bugs. I thought they called SLAs, right? Yeah. But, 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 yeah, but, but not, that's the but equivalent not of what zero I right. so you're gonna right. And you're, you're not going to be zero. personally responsible. Yeah. But this yeah. goes back to a fundamental dirty piece of the security game, and I've lived it, which is FUD. So much of yes. our security yes. industry yeah. is based on FUD. Yes. We couldn't wait for Graham Leach Bliley and, and, and Sarbanes Oxley and all these, because you could go to the executive and say, how do you look in stripes? <laughs> you know? yeah. And and it, that's it what we sold. That's what we sold. That's what we sold by. We have another question back here. We're going to grab in a second. But I want to throw one other subject to just stew on, and that is this responsibility issue. You know, part of what I take out of my DevSecOps thing is that security really needs to be everyone's responsibility. Security people are still ultimately own it but it's everyone's responsibility. So I've, I've become friends with Sidney Decker. And again, um, just to give you a quick background, there's nothing to do IT. Um, he goes in when a plane crashes and the first start of the conversation was pilot nice. error. And then he spends a lot of time proving that that's a bunch of bullshit. It's systems. It's like, have you ever looked at the Air France 447? Like it's fascinating, yeah. the complexity. These are complex systems. I read and, those things like mystery yeah, novels. Right. And, and so, but here's the thing, right? Like. Like what? Will, and and Deck will send me like these jokes, like like a pilot era, like another, and we both giggle, right? Because these are complex systems. And then again, I'm not here to make fun of Equifax and jump in the bandwagon. But when you see the CEO say, "It was this person," like you're so wrong on how you're thinking. You know, Deck will talk about a restorative culture, a, a just culture, 
how you need to think about, you, you, you just can't blame people. You, you got it all wrong, yeah. if because even if it was that person, it's the system that engaged and created that person. So as we yeah. start talking about punitive and like, and, and I know it's hard, FinTech, they've got to do stuff, Wall Street, all the stuff that's created them. But like, we are go like, you are not going down a high performance path if you're trying to institute like this, like punitive, restorative justice, um, like you have to sign a document that owns and, and, and that's you'll so never get anywhere. That's so and that's against the won't DevOps make anything is. more secure anyway. Well, right? No, talk about, a, talk about a blameless post-mortem, yeah. right? <laughs> All right, well, we got a quick question here. Yeah, I've, we'll work for uh, security vendors. I mean, pretty much name them. I've worked at all of them. And as you talked about, you know, the, the, the concept, there is no perimeter anymore and so forth. But you look at a, at a lot of the tools, and one of the reasons I got out of that, that segment is it's all using last decades or last centuries technologies to try to deal with, with this. Where, where do the current and the evolving security vendors have a responsibility to jump in and figure out how to play in the DevOps world? Yeah, there's a, there's a lack of the... There's a lack of understanding on the part of the old school security vendors in terms of what does a DevOps tool chain look like? What do DevOps processes look like? And how can we play in those arenas? How do you, how do you actually figure out what people are doing and then help them uh, versus giving them yet another thing to do? Um, you know, if part of the whole DevOps thing is to try and prevent you know, unplanned work and rework, you know, why give some more unplanned work to do? Why not, why not try and figure out what the planned work is uh, and integrate? Let's be clear, um, in this new threat landscape where there's new threats every day, you know, one of the things we have to do is we have to be prepared to both use our DevOps process to rapidly trans transform, transform, I'm not, I'm sorry, Jonathan's in this room. He doesn't like me using that word, but uh, uh, the re the reality is, you it's, you know, Struts Two is a perfect example, right? Those doing DevOps remediated that within two hours across a global organization because they had DevOps, no. and, and it was awesome, right? That was the root. not really was because there was like the stuff you didn't know. Oh, and right? they didn't know that. That was the hard part, right? Yeah. Where the stuff buried in devices and so they zero. found all that. Uh, so, yeah, not quite because the the signature didn't come out for. You know, uh, the NIST CV signature didn't come out yep. for at least a week. Anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah but, but once they had it, it was done yeah, in two yeah. hours, right? That's the thing I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. You can and, respond quickly. and we can respond quickly. So that's the good side. Everybody loved DevOps when you told that story, right? But then if, if you've got to build security in the first place, you've got to build it into the process. And, and often we haven't done that. And that's where we need to mature. And, you know, that's so that, that's where I want to take us, though. And i got to shut up because it's too good. No, 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 shut listen. up. Go ahead. But no, I mean, did anybody see my presentation earlier? By a few people, yeah. right? So I was at a cyber conference, a cyber Chicago thing, and there was this hacker, anonymous hacker, and he, they, you know, they had him grayed out and all this stuff. And he went on and he talked about five exploits at banks that yep. he did. Four of them he got in because somebody held the door open for him, right? And I'm thinking like, and he says at one point he says, um, "Your people are your worst enemy." I'm like, wait a minute, that's contrary. I'm giving a presentation later today. Says like, "Your people are your most like what." It's great. Hey, that's it. <laughs> and I and I was like, but what do we do? Like like like, is it that simple? Like I, the story I told at the end was: imagine the day in your company where um, somebody, uh, Susie, she's carrying boxes. She's it's raining. It's cold. She's pregnant, and you let the door close, and you wait, and the door opens. She badges in, and you're thinking, oh God, I'm going to yell that, and she says, thank you. Right, so it's a people, I mean, we can spend a billion dollars protecting the perimeter. We can buy a gazillion products. I think we should put everything in the supply chain. Um, but like, it always goes back to how do we work? I mean, how many people have been told over and over, don't hold the door open? And how many people have hold the door open? Because you're tired of getting yelled at by, for 10 years by people. <laughs> but like, like, and this hacker is saying all the money he's made and four of them were his entree was just letting somebody hold the door open for him. So yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it, it's people. You know what, what, back in my security days, we got a call from the Pentagon one time. If we could, uh, we had a NAC product, Network Access Control. And could we develop a test that would determine whether the USB port was open on a laptop? Easy peasy, we could do that relatively quickly. 
come to find out why why did we need that test? Because some ch Chinese agents or Chinese mm. hackers or whatever had dumped a whole bunch of USB keys on the f at the parking lot in the Pentagon, and and mm. someone picked them up, and and it, at the time of what became the F thirty five, I was stealth fighter. The plans for that went over to Beijing, so that's why we don't hold the door open, and that's why we don't pick up USB keys but that, that <laughs> unless it's said, a usb key in a parking lot at heathrow in which case it has all the security plans for all the but, vips and everything but the joke there, is so, we do yeah. right yeah. this guy's telling this audience yeah. my last five yeah. like mega attacks that's how they got in and, and that's why incident response is so important because i think today it's sort of a given that your organization is going to be breached that mm. your organization is going to be compromised the question is how quickly can you detect that and how quickly can you respond to it? So that's a that's also a different way of thinking, right? Um, it's not so much like the fence. If it's going to happen, um, what? Yeah. Right, that's right. And, but, and and are you prepared to handle it, which is inevitable? Right. Okay. And this brings me to what I want to talk about, really focus in on, because these people aren't, they already know security has problems. We all know security has problems. What are we going to do? How do we make security work better? How many of you here are from security, by the way? One, three. <laughs> Okay, four. The overwhelming majority of these people are not from the security team. And yet they showed up. And they came. That's Good for cool. them. But how do we make these four guys work well with everyone else? It's a cultural thing. When, when we do an incident response, it has to be that code, that guy who put struts two into, his, into our code. I'm not saying he has to sign a personal liability thing, but <laughs> he's got to realize it was, it's his responsibility too. How do we? How do we get it in here? Well, I think so that, that was a ask? systems yeah, failure. Right? Gonna, I'm going to call asking. that a systems failure. How does yeah. he know? And how do you, with all the CVs coming out, how do you measure risk? Let me introduce you to this guy. <laughs> no, but, but, Thanks for joining the panel virtually. But, but he's what do we, well, Kirk can explain it better. Yeah, how does he know whether Struts 2 is bad or not? No, no, no. But like you get no, he's saying more broadly. You have a, you have a deluge, right? You have this ginormous monster pile of bugs. How do you, how do you well, prioritize those? If I could pick the one thing that is probably back to the point that I was actually trying to make was it's much the liability, no, although that's a yeah, <laughs> although that's a concern. I mean, that's right. that's at a certain level of the company. Somebody's got to own it. I mean, if it's not me, it's the CEO. It's, it's somebody, right? The right. ownership factor is just a fact of business. The issue was I was owning something that was far more complex than I could see. Yep. And that to me was the problem. Right. Was that I there were 28 systems. They got they're running on hundreds of servers and data centers in the cloud and all over the place. And there's so many things that can be it's such a it's a it's an airplane. It's such a complicated system. It's complicated and it's not like I had a pane of glass to tell me what was going on. So I think to me, that was the problem. It was this disproportionate threat, and it was the thing I had the least amount of visibility in, not the most. Yeah. I had the most amount of visibility into how are features flowing through the backlogs, and how's the release going, and how's, how many help desk tickets am I, I All of those things I knew, because I had SLAs. I had no visibility into, and that to me is where the vendor disconnect comes. If I had, like, I don't think there's any, security vendors in the room. But if you were here and I were giving my a, wish I'm list. A, I'm a security <laughs> vendor. <laughs> my wish list is. It's cool. <laughs> is, and some of this is we do to ourselves. We, how do we write security? It's a, it's a document, okay? Can't, can't do anything with that. No. So how am I gonna dynamically visualize so that my developers can see, so that my ops people can see, so my security people see, so, so the I would put can forth see. the preposition, it's not that the developer could see, it's that the developer, Develop, look, no one in here is going to raise their hand and say, I want to develop insecure software, right? I want to, I want to deploy something that's not secure. You all want to deploy secure software. We get that. But how can we help him deploy, develop right. better software? Yeah. So I have, a, I have a super practical response to your question about prioritization, because I suspect that for the folks in here whose job is development or DevOps, your experience with security is them coming to you with a long list of problems for you to fix that you don't have time to fix, and, and, and that's a problem. So my very pragmatic response to that um, is it's contextual. The number one and two sort of like filters that I would use, which has to do with information sharing and visibility, I would actually argue that the responsibility of a security team is not to like be the one siding on the dotted line, but rather to be the one providing that visibility the number one and two places that I would use to prioritize are number one, security incidents that have worked on your organization, 
what were those problems mm. and go and fix those first. Yeah. Exactly. Number two, security incidents that were not successful on your organization, but were actively attempted. Go and fix those next. Mm. Number three, use something like a manual penetration test to determine which of your vulnerabilities are actually accessible by folks in different locations. And I don't necessarily mean geographical locations, I mean like different places within your within your architecture. <laughs> so so I think that makes it less theoretical and a little bit more now, real and impactful. Can I just make one comment? I mean, it's, you, I mean, it's all, it's, it, it, yes, all above, but Thanks. like even simpler. We need the developers to be security minded. So we need them, yeah, I mean, I, this is what I'm seeing working. Yep. I'm seeing it at Fannie Mae, I'm seeing places where they have GitHub rib hose of how to, the OWASP top 10 examples. Yeah. Don't tell them to go to OWASP, write your own wiki. Oh, and, sucks the, the web UI. And, um, and the same we'll pointers, which is to say incident response and actual yeah. pen test results, can and ought to be used for training and awareness because it's, it's just, different yeah. giving a developer, like, here's a 40 page coding yeah. guideline, read it and then do your job <laughs> yeah, perfectly, <laughs> than to say, look, here are the top like five incidents that actually happened to our organization last year. We're going to teach you all about them. And then yes. that's a little more interesting, too. Yes. I, mean, I, I think we also have to learn from the kind of the safety culture in other industries. I'll say safety culture, but, it, you know, recalls for cars, right? I mean, you have a bill of materials. You know if you ship that part and it's going to explode in somebody's face. I'm not mentioning Acura and my airbag that could have killed me. But, you know, because I don't want to throw them under the bus for that at all. Well, it wasn't um, Acura. Yeah. But that company that made the part, because yeah. I have a Honda, um, like went out of business yeah. because they couldn't do exactly. it. But how many organizations have a build of materials? How many security teams or development exactly. and ops teams for that matter actually know what software they're running and where, right? That is, and that's that is the problem, that that's I the stress two problem. And, and if that doesn't happen in some way or fashion, then it will get regulated that that has to happen. Well, and I, for one, don't want to see that it happen. Is. Yeah. Regulation's coming. Right. And then how, yeah. many, um, how many developers know what the number one attack on their system is? How many security people even know that? <laughs> <laughs> Fair. So we were talking earlier, actually, I have a system where we've got monitoring of the outside in stuff. And when it happens one or two times, it gets shut down. And when it happens a bunch, it pops something into the Slack channel. The developers see, hey, this kind of attack is happening in your system. It's an interesting little, it, it, it had an interesting feedback loop when we started doing that. And That's I was cool. talking about to somebody about this particular vendor about how does it work? And I was like, actually, I have honestly no clue how it works. I have no idea how it works. I just know <laughs> that when something happens, this system tells me. And it's kind of nice, and it seems like it's a good thing yeah. to do. So Mark Miller gave me one of the greatest gifts a couple of weeks ago. He introduced me to Shannon Leeds at Intuit. And um, so she calls this the war room. You took the recall? She has a war room. So she knows everything you've done from the minute you checked in, and I think she might have an opt-in or not, but yeah. like she doesn't stop you. She doesn't break the build. I'm like, you don't break the build. She says, no. She goes, because the last thing you want is a recall. Because now, it would, like, we, we can try to tell you all day long that you should hold the door open, or we can give you a red break in the build. You're like, oh, they did it again to me. Or I can let you get all the way in, and I can let my red team smack the shit out of it <laughs> when it gets in there and say, you, you know, we're taking you down, recall. And this whole word, she's like, you don't want to get recalled into it. Right? Um, you know, so, I mean, there you go. There's an example of somebody who's talking about it, presenting about it. And she also talks about adversaries. Like, how many people know on the hour, on the minute, are you charting? Do you know how your adversaries are? I mean, just watch her videos and, like... Mm. Yeah, yeah, she's great. I wish I've got a question. Okay, I, I have a, a question that might put it more in concrete terms and strays a little into uh, privacy as well. But uh, as an aside, I think DevOps is way better marketing than DevSec test kitchen sink ops. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so the question is about with the GDPR hitting in Europe next May, yeah. uh, I work for a startup and we don't have a lot of experience with compliance and the audits that go along with that. What's the best way for us to tackle this problem? Are you less than 50 people? Engineers, yes. Total in the company? No. Uh, a bit more. OK. Well, I was, I was like looking for an easy way out. Like, it doesn't <laughs> apply to you, but it does. No. <laughs> I am it um, 50. Yeah. I'm not a GDPR expert. I am interviewing a few GDPR experts to write an article that's coming out probably in the next month or so. And when that's out, I'll send it to you. Um, I think that 
what we're talking about, which is to say like this build of materials inventory yeah. thing is super important. So the basic idea behind GDPR is that a person as an individual ought to have some say about their personally identifiable information. Mm -hmm. And as an organization that has information about people, all you need to know is where it is, where it came from. That's like pretty much it. And if you have that like written down, and you have some like reasonably adequate controls of which if you don't know what reasonably adequate controls are, there's long lists of things that can tell you what they are. And they're like, like BSIM has 113 controls. The ISO 27017 has like 121 controls. So I wouldn't go to those actually. I would do, um, I would do NIST CSF, cybersecurity framework, which has like, I don't know, 50, but they're in these like five buckets. Um, it's, it's much more human readable and it was actually meant to be that way. So Barack Obama was like, Hey, I have an executive order. This is supposed to be for critical infrastructure of the United States. And it's supposed to promote prosperity, efficiency, and innovation. And so they sort of wrote this security control framework in this like much more reasonable way, um, than the $200 fence around a $5 asset people. So I don't want to turn this into a GDPR discussion, Not at but, all. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> And uh, there's a lot of FUD around GDPR. I'm going to tell people what GDPR yeah. I mean, I know what European Data Protection Act okay, okay. coming into effect uh, May 24 next year gives uh, Europe, the 34 European states the right where, they, where a company organization fails to conform to the, the act that is enacted. They can, the, 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 the country government, each government can sue your organization for 4% up to, let's get it right, up to 4% of global revenue. <laughs> 34 like times to me. 4 is more than one year's revenue. Effectively, they can put you out of business. Totally. Right? That's, now, there's a whole bunch of stuff to it. There's some stuff where there's some exclusions, which you were alluding to, and there's some inclusions. But one of the interesting facts about it is if you have something that is described as personally identifiable information, and I come to your company and say, under the Act, you will forget about me, you have to demonstrate materially with evidence that you have done it within the time frame, or you are now guilty until proven innocent. And so that's the way it's going to work. Let, let me let me stop so it right here negative, one second. In other words. Yeah. So yeah. first of all, it's in really the audience, how many of you have heard this GDPR term? Oh, wow. Okay. How oh, wow. many? Yeah. Okay. That how many of you at your organizations and you know have have sat down and started mapping out a strategy for compliance with GDPR? <laughs> how many of you have not? Enjoy. So and let me just tell you, even if you're not based in Europe, if you're doing business yeah. with any vendors from Europe or anything else, you, you're, you're on the hook. So it seems like the DevOps talks here, half of them are, are about uh, microservices, right? And, and yet we have to track all the PII, PII that's going through our microservices. And so we have to have a plan, at least to maybe we, maybe we scrub it early on. The system has to be designed. Uh, to accommodate this, right? Yeah. And so the security has to be built in from the start. It can't be bolted on. And the security same thing design. with t a test, yeah. 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 That's, yeah. That's, that's I mean, it's, it's no different for quality. It's no different for performance. Absolutely. You know, I mean, yeah. all of these things have to be built in from the beginning or it's hard to bolt on, right? I mean, it, it's... But, so that brings me back to my first... How, why did I get into DevOps? I'm tired of security being bolted on. I want security yeah. by design. I want, I want this gentleman to have a tool where when he deploys, he wants to make sure he has no vulnerable open source components in, in his development. After it's deployed, I want to run tests to make sure there are no open source. Can you make something like that? I, you know, I'm um, sorry, I don't think we got it. I think like, like I'm telling you right now, I think Chef and Habitat is the only guys that can do this at the beginning. They build YAML to define where the library, it's like if you've used Docker, right? And anybody's used Docker, you do Docker, you do from scratch, yeah. then you do the other thing. Yeah. Habitat, and they say the Cloud Foundry guys can do this too, but the only one I've ever seen that really tracks, I'm gonna from scratch build not only all of my, my infrastructure, but I'm also gonna YAML, well, in fact, it's, it's Bash, but um, it's bash. yeah, I know, I know, but I have a hard time saying that, so it's, I'm just called YAML. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who gets that, right? But but they like they bash up the lib the genesis of the library. So in a struts or the Jakarta thing inside of struts too. Yeah. Like, like because I mean God bless Nexus and and and, and the Sonotype, but like even that's too late. That's a scan down the road. 
uh, you know, that problem, you know, the, the, the Fannie Mae problem, which was what the, the uh, stretch two was identified on March, it was like a Wednesday, on Friday they had the patch, um, but then there was like, I've got a gazillion URLs out there that I don't know where they are. If I knew exactly where the genesis of that library was from a YAML definition again, I could have just hit a button update and it would have spread it out and that's their promise. Now, I'm not Cheryl and Jeff, but I don't think the product's gonna make it over the, the hump, but like, I, don't, like, I could be dead wrong on this, but who is tracking genesis level libraries? Yeah, I don't know. I don't think people are. Yeah. And I don't think there's been a business driver to do so. It's scanning, but that's, again, way too late. Yeah. Well, but you, but you still have to do that, right? Because you have to do it. It, ha it could happen totally. after but, the Genesis part, right? So you, you but, still have to have an after But I want to hit a button and do a commit because I know yeah. Jakarta, and I want some engine. This is all I know where everywhere that is. And, I'm, and, and, and that's the promise of Habitat is that, you know, um, anyway. Yeah, I, I mean, and what you're asking for is the right thing. It's just we haven't seen it really put together yet, right? And uh, I don't want to give an opinions on whether they make it or not, but uh, the reality of it is that uh, we need to get to that point where we're delivering that, right? And that's right. what we need to be talking about. The model's right, right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I always feel like that's a little bit like, you know, the CMDB nirvana that we're oh, just no. going to Oh no, let's somehow... not go there again. No, and that's what it feels right. like a little bit, that somehow that there's this magical yeah, but... thing we're going to implement that's going to tell us everything in our supply chain. And then like two weeks ago, the security bulletin was something about um, the BIOS of an x86 box can be hacked while off. And I went, I, I thought, I don't know, okay. You yeah. know, and then it's not even me. It's, it's like, you want to call Amazon and Microsoft up and go, well, you're running on if your you cloud. If you want lights on, on you know? <laughs> like, you know, it, it, and, you and know well, I mean, it, like, so as if there's a magical button you could hit, it's good, you should, should you know your supply chain? Sure, you should know everything you could know, but I don't think there's ever this magical security it, management database. But, and it gets, even, I mean, it gets complicated it, even in, in that scenario, right? Because you don't know who's, just to get a little bit technical, who's shaded that jar into their own jar, right? right? So now those classes from the jar that has the CV are, you know, incorporated into this other thing, which nobody knows about. But I mean, that made you know, so you got to go pretty deep. I mean, that to, would know. I mean, again, because everything was built from, excuse the pun, scratch. Does, doesn't, ma doesn't matter if you don't know that that code is embedded in this no, other you jar. Build it. You build it. You build it. You oh. define it. You that's define part of the uh, methodology. I mean, yeah. I'm not saying it's easy. Built everything from absolute yeah. I'm not saying it's easy. But, but who it's... builds anything from absolute that's scratch? Yeah. So that's a problem. I mean, that's, I mean, that's not the, the model. Mm -hmm. Hey, we've got about 20 minutes or so, something like that left. And, and I, want, I want these people to walk out of here with some practical tips. <laughs> I'm out of okay. here. No. <laughs> from the impractical. And I'm done. No, no. <laughs> practical <laughs> tips. How can they go back to their organization? they go back to their organization? start working more closely with their security teams, getting security to be really truly everyone's responsibility, if not their job, and, and making more secure code without all of us adopting Chef Habitat to support John's stock uh, ownership. Um, <laughs> I got two kids going to college, hey. Man. <laughs> Seriously, so I'm gonna give each one of you, give me your, your top three, whatever you wanna say, and then we'll have the audience have at it. All right, Curtis? Uh, my, my number one is you gotta have that conversation. And, and, and not just in a meeting, I, like have lunch. Like try to get to know your counterpart. So if you're coming from security, you wanna go know those app dev managers, or if you're like me, you're gonna wanna go get to know those security people and, and start to have real conversations because that's what was missing before. Those conversations never took place, right? So I think that's my number one tip is you know, we're at a time where there's tremendous opportunity and technology and new ways to think about this. Um, I think we got to look at our budgets and realign them. I think security budgets are woefully misaligned to today's sort of breakdown of where we need to be spending our money. Um, and just start having those conversations, right? Because that's what that's what DevOps is about. And then and then you're going to work towards. I think it was alluded to here. Mean, how do I? How, how do I give visibility? How do I reduce mean time to detection? How do I reduce mean time to remediation? This is a constant theme with all things DevOps. Security is no different. Yep. Excellent. Yeah. Paula. I guess what I would, um, my, I agree with all that. Um, what I would say is that um, you can't control for complexity. It is. Engineering is hard. Security is harder. And what you can control for is how your team behaves in the environment they live in. And so one thing I think you can do actionably is as a team, which hopefully includes security as well as all the other stuff, 
um, practice defending as a team. And that might mean practice in a fake scenario, you know, war game. And it might mean practice for real, because um, for real happens quite a bit enough that you can get plenty of practice. But, <laughs> but don't just let that be your security team's job. Make that the whole team's job. And the more you can work that as a team, the better you can help everyone on that team get better at doing this thing together. Because that's something actionable you could do even if you can't fix all the vulnerabilities you're going to live in, even if you don't you know, do chef or whatever. Oh boy, I'm right? going to take a beating Sorry. on this one. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're going to tweet oh, about yeah. that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, John. You know, uh, Gene talks about the uh, core chronic conflict mm -hmm. and the construction of it. And so DevOps was an original core chronic conflict, right? And what was interesting that most people who have been like fighting this battle, you know what the second core chronic conflict was? After DevOps like was kind of solved? was QA. And so one of the battles that we had to deal with early on, which was the QA people were like, oh my God, what are they doing? They're trying to put us out of a job. And we were like, no, 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 no. What I want you to do is put your meta and your brain into this thing we're doing. And it worked magically. I tried to do this with network creeping. It didn't work well. I think the security people, it will work. Like, like instead of this, you over there, we're here, Let's use the QA model and convince them we need their meta in the pipeline at every level, at the IDE, at the, uh, when you check in your code, in the CI build, in the vulnerability scanning, and just invite them to the damn party. Agreed. Yeah, so I'll build on what's been said. And uh, one of the things I've seen used successfully now is where organizations are starting with DevOps. So one of the things that I'm um, working a lot of financial orgs one of the things, uh, the mandatory requirements we put in is security have to come in and be part of the product team. Yeah. That's it. Now, they're going to do that for, and I know you talk about this, they're going to do it for skills transfer, they're going to do it for good practice development, and they've got to do it to help the team transform the way they go about doing their work. So that's one of the things we see. Some organizations keep them in there. In fact, a large uh, health insurance company in the Midwest just did that. They had a security team of 400 people. They just dissolved it, and they moved all the security people. They're still a community practice, but they are now in the product mm. teams. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, I would say take a security person to drinks because the stories might be better that way. <laughs> um, but, but, but I mean, obviously, seconding everything that's been said, I, you know, know, know what you're shipping, know your bill of materials, whatever product you use to do that or, or, or whatever process you, you use to do that because you're going to have to answer that question at some point. And, and you don't want to take hours or days to, to, to answer that question. Um, I think that's probably the most practical uh, thing I can say. Carolyn, you got the anchor. Yeah. yeah, so I'm very much on board with what Curtis is saying in particular. You got to knock on someone's door and have a conversation. And specifically, what do you have that conversation about? Um, this is actually kind of unusual for me to be at a not security conference. I'm usually at a security conference telling security people to be the one to go knock on the door. And my recommendation for that conversation is to ask your technology leaders and your business process owners what are your objectives? And then try and figure out what might jeopardize those objectives. And guess what, security person, that becomes your marching orders. Excellent. All right, we've got some questions. We Just to level set, we have about eight minutes. So we've got time for a bunch of questions, but I want to get you out of here on time. OK. I think you actually had a good point earlier about DevOps can help you respond to an incident faster, if, uh, which I witnessed. You know, we had, across a large team, we had a major security incident come out where everything had to get updated like yesterday, right? And being able to basically say, you know, most teams have responded in two hours. We're good. And a few hadn't because of a variety of, you know, technical debt and a variety of other reasons. But the yeah. fact that most could respond like that on a dime with a high quality, no risk, nobody was sweating bullets that that deployment was going to fail. That is, that's value to security. Yep. Just being able to get to the place 
where you can put an emergency release into production without scaring someone. <laughs> hey, and, and, and they could do it because they did it every day. So this is this release is no different than that release. But you That's wanna, a valuable thing to a security you practice, even if oh, even if you don't work in all the other Nirvana no, no, I, security. I get it. This is a book, Gene. When Gene recommends your book, you read it. Um, and Gene Krantz, uh, NASA, uh, um, failure is not an option. Yep. And it's, it's kind of a head. It's a, like how the, and the, the remember Apollo thirteen in the movie at Harris, and like like not on my dime. They didn't get a committee together. They didn't figure out should we get tinfoil at Walmart or um, or Target, right? Um, they just did. They, they that that's MTTR. That's that's how you, your point your point about incident. How good are you in that? Don't spend all the days figuring out how to stop failure and. You know, between right. failure, like when it like it's going to happen, it may happen ten days in a row. It might not happen once every five years, but it's gonna happen. And um, like, how are you, Gene Kranz and his team, where you were able to get to that place? And again, the whole history of how they had to define operations at NASA in response yeah. is a brilliant book. It's a great story. So let me hit on something that kind of been alluded to here and, and spoken about here is that as much as security can help our dev and ops teams and our DevOps teams, we could use a little DevOps in security. We need to automate more, mm -hmm. right? Amen. Oh yeah. We, we do a shit, yeah. a crappy job of automating it, it, with security. We need, we need to open up those cold dead hands, <laughs> right? And, and give a little bit, give a little bit of responsibility, a little bit of, of control. You guys are the ones doing the code. You know what? And we're not inherently smarter than the developers, nor are developers inherently smarter than security people, right? But there has to be a bit of a shared knowledge going on here. These are all basic DevOps tenants, right? This don't, is- We this don't is, have humans doing things that you can automate. Yeah, have humans doing the things that you can't. Well, Carolyn's so thinking I, about yeah, that. Yeah, so I have, I have like sort of a you know different side of the. I have a different perspective, right? So I think the things that are the best candidates for automation are things that you know how to do really well and that you do all the time. So in security, there are totally things like that. And there are things like static analysis tools to help you with that. But there's all sorts of stuff that can't. So even when we're talking software development and we're not talking security stuff, there are some tests that are like really good candidates for automation, unit testing, integration testing, you know, performance testing, but there are others that are like not so much, right? User acceptance testing, usability testing, story level testing. Similarly, when it comes to security, guess what? Okay, not only are the people using your pro the 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 people using your products are people and not machines, um, but guess what? The people attacking your products uh, are also people and not machines. If, if you, as an organization, <laughs> are, are compromisable via an easily automated attack, uh, you really need to step it up. Um, but for the vast majority of organizations, the interesting and the effective attacks uh, are those done by a person and not a machine. I, I don't disagree with that per se, but I, but I find very often when people say um, can't, what they really mean is won't. Yeah, I, I, I'm right. totally not saying yeah. can't. No. I'm just saying yeah. that, like, in your, you know, like, work that you do, you do 100 hours of work, it's going to make tons of sense to automate some of that work, and it's going to make absolutely no sense to automate other parts of that work. Uh, okay, and it, but, and but it's that, not worth okay, spending time. Computer. I mean, th th here's the thing. I used to say automate everything when I was starting out with Chef, and then I realized that's not right. You are spot on. You automate everything that you can. Because, I mean, you think about Shannon's 35-person red team, right? That's an example. I don't want to automate that. Those people, that's what they, they are the adversaries inside her company that every day are humans figuring out, how do I do this? What should I do that? How do I do that? So I am like religion. But I think that's a little, bit of a, I think that's a little bit of a straw man. I think that's a little bit of a, that's a little bit of a straw man though, I think, because what you don't want to have is something that's not automated and you have to do it at three in the morning when you're under attack. When you're right? under attack, guess so. what? You're waking up. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, it's okay. not gonna yeah. be like, oh, we're under attack. This yeah. automatic, like, yeah. magical robot yeah. is gonna save us. Like, we're definitely not gonna <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I, would agree, I would agree that we should totally automate that which we can, but I guess I don't agree that we can't automate more of the security than 
Ooh, is what yeah, that's, what's, what's automated like, today. Yeah. I don't Five, six, seven, eight yeah. years ago, we didn't have all the testing automation that we have today, and smart people yes. came together to build all of that stuff, yeah. right? So yeah. the smart people that, that can build that stuff, they had to go talk to QA, they had to figure all that stuff out. We got to talk to security and figure all that out because we need JUnit equivalent, Cucumber equivalent for security, for automated pen yeah. testing. Yeah, we yeah, can't yeah. say it's for too sure. hard, yeah. right? Yeah. Security has to be code yeah. Yeah. like config yeah. is code, yes. right? Definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. 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 Another yeah. question. Or a statement, that was excellent. <laughs> yeah, I just want to pick up on that. I totally agree. You have to automate it. Anything you leave as manual, someone can leave the door open or the window open. We're human, we make mistakes. Also, it's interesting because the hackers, we get smarter with our technology, but the hackers get smarter. Remember when 64-bit keys came out? Oh, that can't be hacked, two days. 128-bit keys, oh, that can't be hacked, two months. They're gonna keep doing it. We have to automate everything. Yeah, but but the, it's people, like the door. You listen to this. We made hacker. mistakes. He, he did a week's reconnaissance going to the coffee shop to watch how they dressed. He, 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 yep. he cloned their badges. He went ahead and he got in. He went, sometimes he said when he, he would make like he was having a fight with his wife so people stayed away with him so he could get in the door. Um, the, the, there's stories of social engineering of... Um, like a CEO that is a virus that's going to wake up and for the point is automate everything that you possibly can, but it don't go down the false narrative of that everything. you can automate everything. Well, but I think be creative about automating. Like, I guess I would say we use that as there's too many folks that say, well, that can't be. And I think there's a creative yeah. element okay. yeah. uh, into the credit to our ISOs and their creativity around automating. I mean, I think it's a force multiplier. It can be. And they automated, um, social engineering tax and phishing and, and even they even um, yep. used Alexa to automate fake mm -hmm. um, phone calls to your desk to see if you would give up information. Yeah. And um, just for the record, 12% of people totally give the keys David. to the kingdom. No, no, no. <laughs> That's not wondering. unusual. It's though. not. It's, and, more won't than and, so, and then than we exactly. measured doing a campaign yeah, and did it work and no people yeah. still give up the keys to the kingdom, but, yeah. but we at least knew who run. did yeah. okay. and how many, <laughs> no, and, and at least Alan, we knew how many go. people did. Yeah, we're running, we got 350. Yeah. Yeah. All right, you know what, we're yeah. gonna need to wrap it up really quick. Give a hand to our audience here. <laughs> I mean, to our, to our audience and our panel. Hey, just real quick. Carol, Carolyn's a friend of mine from the security world, and I called her up and said, I need some security yep. peeps yeah. at this. She came <laughs> in. She's never done a DevOps thing, so Thanks. give her a special round. <laughs> and to the rest of my friends.